You've probably heard that you can't combine endurance and strength. And if you do, it'll wreck your gains. This concept is called the interference effect, and it's rooted in molecular biology. Today, we're going to break down what it is, what research has found on it, and give you tips on how to minimize it while optimizing training for both strength and endurance. Training for endurance consists of continuous or interval training where the person does a cyclical movement, typically for 20 to 60 minutes. This causes a cascade of cellular processes that lead to mitochondrial biogenesis, angiogenesis, and more. In contrast, lifting is usually short bursts of intensity against a heavy resistance with a full recovery between sets. This leads to a chain of reactions where mTOR activity increases, muscle protein synthesis is elevated, and neuromuscular changes occur for strength. These are very different stimuli, leaving our body with a tricky situation for adapting. When these two stimuli occur at the same time, they can interfere and blunt one another. This concept was first studied 42 years ago where Hickson split people into three groups, a strength group, an endurance group, and a combined group. These groups trained very hard for 10 weeks and were assessed for progress. The endurance and combined groups saw similar increases in VO2 max, while the strength group, unsurprisingly, made no real change. When you look at the strength results, things get more interesting. The strength group and combined groups saw similar results for the first six weeks. But then during the last four weeks, the combined group started to decrease strength adaptations. Hickson titled this the interference effect. And from there, research began to center in on the mechanisms of what was going on. This concept spiraled to the point where there are people worried that cardio is gonna kill all their gains, avoiding at all expenses, and endurance folks are fearful of lifting any kind of weight. Fortunately, it's not that simple. Essentially the theory of the interference effect. Um, it's basically that if you do certain, like cardio essentially is the stimulus there, it will go and block something called mTOR, which is essentially the, like the, the signal that your muscle needs for muscle protein synthesis and adaptations to those things. That's Alyssa Olnick, a doctor of exercise physiology and an expert in concurrent training, where you combine strength and endurance. As she mentioned, much of the research early on focused on molecular mechanisms, which do occur. However, since that time, there's been a lot more research into application, questioning how much we need to worry about it. For instance, a brand new systematic review and meta-analysis from Pito et al. looking at this topic found that concurrent training led to similar changes in maximum strength for both the upper and lower body, and had similar improvements in cardiorespiratory capacity. From this and other studies, it's safe to say that the interference effect is not quite as big of a deal as often thought of. I personally feel like the interference of the two is more related to fatigue and managing fatigue, um, recovery and those things rather than trying to stopping your pathways from doing this because the amount of which it's occurring at might not actually be meaningful at the whole body level because you're still probably giving enough of a stimulus for your body to adapt to these things. So the interference effect is still happening, but it's just not as impactful as people previously thought. Instead of being worried about minute molecular biology features, consider the whole picture of the interaction between training for endurance and strength at the same time. This is where a lot of people make key mistakes that end up costing them overall progress. But it's more so fitting them in. So I think people like to blame the interference for something occurring rather than you just reduce the volume of something else while doing the other thing. So I think it's important to recognize, like I think, when you don't understand what's happening at a molecular level or a scientific level or physiologically, you're like, well, I started running and I lifted less. Well, did you also start lifting less too? Was it necessarily the interference or was it just what you were telling your body to do in the process? So there is interference within your muscles that does happen. These cascades are there. I think that they get blown out of proportion in relation to our own training, unless we're talking maybe like the elite of the elite who are trying to minimize anything that's gonna blunt their performance effects for like just strength sports or just endurance sports. This is why it's important to consider your starting point. Are you coming in to concurrent training as a novice in both doing very little volume in each? Or are you well experienced at one, training pretty hard at that and not at all experienced in the other, looking to add it in. A study from Petra et al. found that for novices and intermediates, there's no negative impact when combining the two activities. However, 
For trained individuals, there was an impact, which makes a lot of sense. If you're a novice or intermediate, you're likely not pushing your intensity or volume to a crazy level, not undertaking a ton of fatigue or nervous system demand. In contrast, if you're a more experienced individual, you're likely pushing these variables, reaching fatigue from training for just one of them. And then to add on the other without good programming or strategies is gonna leave you smoked. This is where understanding how to optimally organize your training for combining these two comes in. These five tips will help you in structuring your training to maximize your improvements in both strength and endurance. Number one, timing. If you're able to split your training into separate sessions, you'll be in the best situation possible. That study from Petra et al. that had found trained individuals had a negative effect on their gains when doing concurrent training also found that if individuals were able to separate sessions by at least three hours, there was little to no negative effect in the long term. This might mean doing your cardio in the morning and lifting in the evening, or vice versa. Now, this isn't possible for everyone, which is where the next few points come in. Number two, order. Doing lifting before running or doing speed work before lifting, depending on the priority of your sessions, that's usually how I would recommend it. I think a lot of people are like, you should always lift before you run or if running is your priority, you should run before you lift. I think that if you're doing easy running, always put it after lifting because it's so much it, easy stuff is like, you can do that all day long on slow legs or burnt, like always do your slow running after you're lifting. So if you have to do both in the same session, think about which is the most important for you and which is more demanding. If you're a strength focused person, you should generally aim to lift first since you don't want your endurance work to crush you and limiting your lifting performance. In contrast, if you're an endurance focused person and need to do hard and fast running, lifting first will limit your performance, at least in the short term. Number three, intensity. If you need to move fast or push really hard on something, you want to be relatively rested for it. And you need to understand that doing it will impact the other training near it. That strength is very neuromuscular. I think they just think it's muscle. They just think strength is all muscle, but like pure strength is very neuromuscular. So like your nervous system is playing a large contribution to your force output and what you can produce in that running at high volumes or high intensities decreases that. Like, so you're going to essentially have a lower nervous system output. For instance, if you have a speed session planned for running, you don't want to have done a bunch of heavy deadlifts prior, or vice versa. Instead, separating these high intensity activities across the week to allow for optimal recovery and performance in each session is ideal. Alternatively, if you have a high intensity session planned and want to do a second session, pairing it up with a lower demanding activity would be ideal. For example, if you're doing heavy squats, you could follow it up with a long slow run. On the flip side, if you have sprint intervals on the agenda, you could hit up some accessories like split squats and calf raises afterwards. Number four, volume. Just like with intensity, how much you do is a critical component in the overview of managing the stress with combining these two activities. When we look back at that research study that started this all off, Hickson had the concurrent group do both the full strength and full endurance programs. Slapping together two folk programs is generally not a great idea and a surefire way to run into overtraining, which likely occurred in that study. Layering on more and more volume just won't work. Instead, think about what volume is getting you the most return on your investment and which is not as necessary. When you do concurrent training, there's overlap between the two activities. For instance, lifting heavy and fast is a great way to develop your ATP phosphocreatine system which is similar to what sprint interval training is used for. Alternatively, training intervals at VO2 max and above can elicit favorable adaptations for endurance and possibly hypertrophy. So when you look at your training program, consider what may be giving you diminishing returns and could possibly get cut out, allowing you to focus on the most beneficial stuff. Number five, mode. As of the current time, there doesn't appear to be any meaningful interference when doing lower body cardio with upper body strength or upper body cardio and lower body strength. Therefore, if you have to do combined sessions, try to put more demanding cardio with more demanding strength work for the opposite body region. This should lead to the best results possible. These five tips should help you lock in your training for strength and endurance. If you found this video helpful, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe for more content. If you have any questions or requests, 
put them in the comments down below.